name is Thomas Gilbert, sponsored by Innova Champion Disc, and you're listening to the Chain Clickers Podcast. You're listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast with your hosts, Quinn Ferris and Horatio Gonzalez. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers. What is going on, everyone? Welcome into the Chain Clankers Podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Ferris, here as always with Horatio Gonzalez. We got a fantastic episode for you guys today. If you missed last episode, hey, check it out. We talked to Logan Harpool, who is the 2020 winner of the Keeper of the Chains tournament. He literally won the tournament the weekend before our interview came out. So really awesome conversation with him. Today's episode, we're going to be talking to Thomas Gill. Gilbert, arguably the best Canadian player on the Disc Golf Pro Tour right now. It was a fantastic conversation that we had with Thomas, and I think it was really informative, and anyone of any skill level can take a lot from this interview and learn from it and have a good time listening to it. Horatio, what, what were your takeaways from this interview? Yeah, what's going on, everybody? I am super excited about this episode. We didn't really mean to, but we got into kind of a rabbit hole about putting but everything there's so many gold nuggets in there to take away about putting um thomas gilbert is an amazing putter from circle two circle one and i think you guys would be really happy with a lot of the information he has to give us about that it also breaks down the run-up and using the angle to open up your gaps uh when you're driving from a tee that you don't have the best look for so a lot of good stuff here um, thank you so much to Thomas for coming on, but let's get right to the episode. What is going on, everyone? We are sitting down here with Thomas Gilbert, sponsored, as you heard in the intro by Champion Innova Discs, a very talented young disc golf player coming onto the scene, someone who you're going to be hearing his name for many, many years to come, someone we are very excited to talk to today. Thomas, how are we doing today, man? Doing great. All right. And so, Thomas, where can the people follow you at on, you know, Instagram, Twitter, maybe? Where, where can people connect with you on social media? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on my Facebook and my Instagram. My Instagram handle is at ThomasGilbert54. So, yeah, I try to keep active on those, let people kind of see into my life a little bit more. Sweet. That's awesome. So let's just start here. Let's start kind of with your journey in disc golf and let's start with the very beginning. So I guess what age did you start playing disc golf and kind of what got you into disc golf in the first place? So I started when I was 16 and my uh, friend from high school, he played with his uncle a bit. So he, he showed me the sport, he brought me out to a local course and played my first round for the first time. And, uh, enjoyed it a lot it, for me it was just kind of like fun it wasn't really good it was like s- skying all the shots like everyone kind of does at the beginning but then um i think the second time out i met someone who actually kind of showed me like the proper reach back and uh, i think my drive went an extra 100 feet and i was then immediately hooked and bought a bit more discs and started playing every single day and eventually just led into kind of the career i've made for myself now did you play any sports before you started playing disc golf? Yeah, I played a whole bunch of different sports. I mean, like badminton, tennis, volleyball, um, basketball a little bit, track and field. So I, I always did a whole bunch of sports. I was like pretty active and usually on the school teams, but disc golf's the first sport that I really like took to the next level. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say that at least the beginning of that sounds a lot like how you got started, Horatio. Um, yeah. if, if you want to touch on that real quick. Yeah. I mean, you just took me out and then that, since that one, one time that you took me out, I was just obsessed and just started playing every single day. But I mean, Hey, hopefully I'm where you're at in uh, four years. That would be awesome. Cause that's about, yeah. so you've been playing for about four years, seriously steady now. Right. So since 2016, mm-hmm. what, yeah. what, how long were you in that, uh, I guess, did you start doing tournaments? How early on in your career did you, like, do a tournament? Um, so I played my first tournament after, like, four months or so after discovering the sport. And so I, I got into it yeah, really, really quickly and was playing pro, I think, by the end of my second year. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, the, the scene up on, in Ontario or up in Canada is a little different. Yeah. So, like, the I quickly 
built myself up to the the top ranks of the AMs. Um, I think my second or third advanced tournament I won, and then I won, I think, three in a row, and then I moved up to Open and started competing there. Yeah, that's awesome. How did your first tournament go? Sorry, Q. No, you're fine, man. Um, My first tournament was pretty good. I actually signed up in Open because – they didn't have any spots left in advance and I just, I didn't know the like race of signing for tournaments at that point. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I hadn't played that bad. I was on chase card after the first round with like a nine fifty rated round or something like that. And then nice. eventually kind of fell back into my spot. I think I shot like a 900 and a 890 rated second and third round. But oh yeah. I mean, fun. even I that's good. It. Yeah, that's still yeah. a really good round. I mean, especially for your first disc golf tournament. Um, so I guess kind of take us through a little bit. You know, I feel so at least a lot of Americans in the game right now, they really typically only see Americans playing in these big time tournaments outside of maybe Simon or yourself. So have there really been any massive differences between disc golf up in Canada and then disc golf down here in the States that you've noticed? Yeah, I would say the level of play is a little bit lower in Canada. It's getting better, though. There, we have a few thousand-rated players now. Um, but also just, like, the density of courses is a lot smaller in Canada. So we'll have maybe, like, three or four courses within an hour drive, where it seems like a lot of places in the States will have 30 courses within an hour drive. Yeah. So that was, like, the main difference that I noticed down here versus up in Canada. Do you usually go back home during once the season's over and go back there and train, or do you do you stay here? Yeah, so I'm actually only allowed in the States um, six months of the last 12 months of the year. So I, I definitely go back to Canada during the off season and kind of like rest up and practice up as well. During the off season, I guess, you know, because you've been a pro for a couple of years now, what would you say have been some of the things that you've worked on during the off season? And, you know, how, I guess, as new disc golfers really finding the sport, you know, because I know we've met a ton of people who have really gotten into it once the whole coronavirus situation hit and there wasn't a whole lot to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, hey, I'll go throw some discs outside. This has always looked fun. I guess I'm going to go try it out now. You know, how do people like that who are really into the sport right now then they got to go through winter where you can't really play as much. So I guess what are some things during the off season that you can do to kind of, you know, stay loose, stay fresh and kind of just stay hungry and get better for when the season does kind of pick back up there in February. Uh, I would say the biggest thing that I do in the off season usually is just putting. So I'll, I'll putt for like an hour or two every single day. And I think that also not only is something that you can do constantly throughout the entire year, but, it's something that improves your game almost the most significantly as well. Yeah. I always say when I'm practicing or like when I'm having a good game or when if I go out, the difference between a good game and a bad game is my putts. Like those are going to make or break you. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I mean, at a lot of tournaments that I played even in recent past, like I can have a day where I'm like shanking off the tee and, then like putting myself kind of within putting range and getting up and down for par and even sometimes birdie. And that can be like a round saver. Like I can come off the course saying, Oh my God, I was shanking so bad. It must be such a bad round, but it still rates like 10, 20 or something. And I'm still in the yeah. loop just because my putting stayed consistent. Yeah. And, you know, talking about that consistent putting, and I think we've seen it in some notable guys that I want to throw out there along with yourself, some guys like Kevin Jones, some guys like Eagle McMahon, even Calvin Heinberg as well, who like are just absolutely deadly from circle two. And you're completely right. It can turn something that, you know, might be par or a bogey into a birdie, into an Eagle, into a par save when you probably shouldn't have saved it in the first place. And, you know, a lot of our listeners, are newer to the game and maybe that's where they're struggling the most so I guess what would you tell someone or you know maybe just an am right now how can you get better at putting you know I know you mentioned you would go out and practice putting for an hour or two during the winter what are the kind of things you're doing when you're doing that practice or is it just you know throwing at the basket from various points uh, around it yeah so I mean I kind of break it down um uh, usually when I'm putting it's I'll do a lot of repetitions from just kind of like close distances 
And I think that's really important when you start out putting practice is just getting that muscle memory in place. And then once you do that, and also later on in your practice um, putting routine, you can start varying your putts, like going from different areas and practicing different stances. But I think just getting motion of like your normal putt down is extremely important to just keeping it consistent and have clean, smooth putt every single time that you can trust on the course. When you started out, did you naturally just fall into a certain kind of putting, a push putt or a spin putt, or did you kind of try both out and see what worked best or what uh, worked during a game and then go with that? Yeah, so I mean, it, a lot of it was just what was comfortable. So like my grip, it just how I naturally gripped a putter. And then, um, yeah, I kind of, I had more of a spin putt to start, like coming like kind of almost outside my body and really spinning it at the basket as hard as I could. But then I was, as I was watching coverage of like Jomez or spin TV back in the day, then I noticed like all these guys kind of had this kind of style reach follow through of their putt and so I tried to implement that a bit into my putting style as well and then that kind of just developed my putt into the form it is now. Nice and so you know putting and especially being sponsored by Innova I know they've got some fantastic putters out there I'm a big fan of the AVR or the AVR X3 which putter are you throwing in is that a putter that you know maybe somebody newer to the sport or somebody that's kind of getting involved can they throw it right away you know I know we see other end of a guys like Ricky throwing a pig should you go that route should you go the AVR route what kind of putter do you use and what would you recommend to someone um so when it comes to putters I feel like comfort in the hand is really important so I would I would yeah I would test out a few putters like see what kind of molds you'd like and then uh like I put with the big bead AVR right now. So, but I mean, it's really what feels clean in your hand. And I also like throwing putter, I have the, the Nova, which works really well for any types of uh, level of player. So yeah, that's kind of what I recommend and just more comfort over necessarily performance at the beginning. Okay. For someone that's pretty new, would you recommend more of a overstable putter or something more neutral? What do you think would be better for someone just starting out? Definitely a neutral putter. I mean, there. I think for Innova, um, like the DX AVR is a great putter to just start out at because it's, it's very neutral flying. It has a very kind of normal shape to a putter, and, and it, you can kind of make adjustments from there, whether you want a more overstable or a less understable putter. Um, but I think that just the AVR in general is a great putter to start at and kind of work your way around. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I definitely was a big fan of the AVR and something that I definitely still have in my bag today. And, you know, talking about putting and talking about, you know, getting more consistent and we all have experienced it just being out there on the course of highs and lows of putting and the highs and lows of disc golf in general. And something that a lot of our listeners have expressed to us is, you know, how do you stay, I guess, calm during the middle of the round? How, you know, if you throw a bad shot or if you miss a putt, you know you shouldn't have missed or maybe it lifts out or something like that, you know, what is it when something goes wrong on the course calms you down and allows you to continue to still play up at a very high level and still compete in tournaments? Yeah, that's something that's really, really hard and difficult to learn and kind of accept. Like, I think a lot of it is, just letting go of the shot that you threw immediately. Like even, even if it's a great shot, like there, there have been times in the past where I have thrown a fantastic drive and I'm telling myself all the way walking up, oh, nice, you got to tap in, good job. And then like I'll just not even give any thought to the putt and, and perhaps yeah. miss it. And that's one of the most annoying things. And so it, it's really good to just not let any of your shots affect you like too much in a good way or a bad way and just keeping that level head will help you just execute the very next shot to your best of your ability okay cool i think i think that's enough on on putting we didn't really mean to turn this into a, a putting clinic i think it's all good info we just kind of went down that that rabbit hole there but it's all good info but i want to kind of go back a little bit to uh 
you said you remember when you started out watching some guys Gomez. And so I guess thinking back to some of the guys that you used to watch and maybe look up to and now you're playing with them. And one thing that I've noticed when I watch uh, tournaments every weekend or whatever, it seems like there's there's a different group of guys in the top 15, top 20 every weekend. Or every other weekend, there's a new name popping up every other month. And there's obviously a lot of new players. But do you think the level of competition is going to rise uh, pretty quickly here in the next year or so? Because just the amount of players that are coming into the game. Yeah, there's there's a lot of really good new breakout players. I mean, Ezra Adderhold and Kyle Klein and a bunch of other new younger players are breaking into the scene and having really good finishes. And um, yeah, Ricky and Paul are kind of having to really compete at an extremely high level just to stay on top of the leaderboard when you could kind of guarantee a few years ago that it'd just be them two racing to the finish. So I think it's a really exciting time for disc golf. I think it's only going to get more competitive and more exciting in the future. I'm really glad you said that because I feel as though that's true. A couple years ago, you know, maybe four years ago, about the time that you were really kind of getting into it, it, it was one of those things where you knew Ricky or Paul was going to win the tournament and it was just them two deciding who was going to do it. <laughs> and now, I mean, prior to Eagle going back to back, we it was five straight different winners at the highest level of disc mm-hmm. golf. I mean, that's incredible. I can't remember what Nate Dawes said, but I think he said that was something that hasn't either has never happened before or has not happened in a very long time. And it shows that there's a bunch of players that mm-hmm. – are coming up through the game and can actually give these guys a run for their money. I mean, this is back-to-back weeks of watching the guys like Paul McBeth, who should be winning these tournaments, coming in second, third, fifth, something like that. And to someone like myself, when I think of Paul McBeth, it's like that guy should win every single tournament. Him getting second is an absolute failure. So for you, I guess, what is your mindset going into tournaments like this? You know, being on cards with guys like Ricky, even being teammates with guys like Ricky, and, and you know, being on a card with Eagle, being on a card with Simon, being on a card with Paul McBeth, you know, are there any kind of nerves there? Or is it just kind of like, hey, I know that this is not necessarily I'm supposed to beat these guys. I'm just going to go out and play my game and show that I do belong on this level and I can compete with these guys. Or, you know, what, what are kind of the emotions going through your body when that happens? Yeah, I wouldn't say I feel, like, nervous anymore. I did – I definitely felt nervous, like, the very first time I played with these big guys on their card. But now it's kind of becoming frequent enough that, um, yeah, it's not that nerve-wracking and just know that I need to – kind of put myself in those positions and then capitalize on those positions. Because, I mean, uh, at Idlewild, for example, me and Eagle were tied going into the final round. And I, I knew what I needed to do. I, I at least said to um, the guys I was staying with that morning, like, I feel like 12 down. If I shoot 12 down, I could possibly win this tournament. And unfortunately, I wasn't the one to do it. But I got to witness Eagle shoot 12 down and win from Chase, which is pretty awesome. Do you think that gives some sort of uh, confidence to the field, just knowing that it's kind of anybody's game now? It's not really – I feel like maybe a few years ago you'd go and you're like, I'm going to give it my best shot, but you got Ricky or Pa here, and they're they're probably going to take it. Now it's like there's so many good players, and it's like whoever plays the course the best is going to win, and it could be me. And it's like anybody's shot at this point. Do you think mm-hmm. that kind of makes the players play a little better? Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, just seeing new players emerging and coming up and winning these tournaments gives the new players that little bit of extra confidence knowing that that could be them the next weekend. I mean, it, it's definitely uh, encouraging to see all these new faces come up in, into the game and having these chances at winning these big events. So, I, I mean, I'm excited to, to see it and participate in it and hopefully do it myself. So yeah, I was going to say, I'm glad you said that because let's not beat around the bush. You are one of those guys. You're one of those up and comers. You're one of those guys who's competing consistently for these tournament wins. And you, you know, you've gotten a couple of wins under your belt yourself. And you're definitely one of those guys who prior to this last weekend, I mean, you were consistently inside the top 20 or right around there. So you're one of those guys. And I imagine 
you're going to break through eventually. We're going to see it, that n- another major win come under your belt. Super excited for that and kind of transitioning that way. Mm-hmm. You're, let, let's put yourself in this situation. Would you rather win the tournament on lead card in the driver's seat, or, you know, maybe you're kind of jockeying with those guys, or would you rather be in, and I guess do kind of what Eagle did the other weekend where you're on chase card and you know, you're just going out there trying to set the world on fire and you don't really have to care what anyone else is <laughs> scoring. You know, I guess, I guess wh- which card would you rather be on going into the final round? Uh, I, I feel like this might be unpopular opinion, but I, I think I'd rather win off lead card, like have a solid, game plan each round, execute it to the level I want to, and then just do a final round that puts the nail in the coffin and has me winning by two or three and doesn't need all the extra drama. But, I mean, those those are the ideal situations is when you you got the win, you're on lead yeah. card, you're getting filmed by Jomez or whatever, and you know you're going to get seen by everybody in the disc golf scene. So that's like the ideal win for, uh, I think, most people in our sport. Definitely. Well, so you're playing great right now. You're doing good. What would you say, I mean, you've played a few tournaments. What would you say right now is keeping you from being on that lead card every tournament or competing for that championship every tournament? What would you, looking at your game? Yeah, I would say it's just the level of consistency. I mean, I, I definitely have all the shots. I mean, in all my practice rounds and tournament rounds, I've had those opportunities to shoot uh, 12, 13, 14 unders like the hot rounds of the tournament are. And so it's just making sure that I can execute the shots that I do every single round instead of just one or two rounds. And that's just something that I think as like a newer player in the game, I'm kind of learning and just trying to – improve on each week and uh, I think that just does come with experience I mean a lot of these guys who are closing out the victories each week have that like five to ten years of tournament level experience at the open level on the top top elite events of the whole PDGA tour Yeah, and I think something our listeners would really like to kind of hear and maybe learn from you about is, you know, when you're driving, you know, throwing your upshot, whatever it is, what, I guess, are you looking for before you release that disc? You know, I know I talked to a lot of AMs at this past tournament we went to, and, you know, a good amount of them in in rec were just like, I'm literally just throwing the disc and hoping for the best. You know, what, are you looking at a point in the sky? Are you looking, you know, okay, if I hit this tree, but I hold it on a hyzer angle I know that's you know kind of where I want to hit you know kind of take me through your your pre-shot routine you know what are you looking for what's kind of going through your head to execute that shot that you were talking about yeah so it all kind of goes to how I break down my practice rounds so during all my practice rounds I I look for those markers so like where on the tee box I'm going to start and I'm going to run up on this angle to open up the line or I'm going to throw at this tree down the fairway and just try to miss it left or right and those, all those different factors that I put in during the practice round, like I'm making sure that I kind of have those things in my mind before I even walk onto the tee box. And then once I walk onto the tee box, it's kind of just like throw the shot that you know you can execute. And so most of the mental preparation is before I even really throw it. And then once I'm there, it's just, okay, you blind yourself up, you know what to do and just your muscle memory has to take over. I think if you're thinking about it too much during the actual throw, it can kind of mess you up and make you shank it by accident. Yeah, definitely. Just hope uh, to talk on the on the run up a little bit, I guess, or that you talked about the angle that you run up on the tee pad. Could you break that down uh, a little bit more for us? So let's say you're going to take it, you want to do a turnover shot. How, what angle are you running up on the tee pad to try and turn over to the right? So for a uh, left hand back hand turnover, I'm definitely starting on the right side of the pad and walking up to the left, kind of opening my shoulders further back to the target. And then that you can open up the line and it lets your body kind of more naturally pull the disc over for that turnover shot. And then same for a hyzer. It's like you'll open up the angle if you 
go from right to left. So you aren't really fighting against your body. You're not trying to over rotate or rotate across your, your body, which makes the shots a lot easier. And then also lining up to a gap can, can be a big difference. If there's like an early tree on the left, you may want to start off the tee pad on the right side and like run up to the front right of it. So you kind of open up that gap a little bit more. And those are kind of important things that I feel like some people forget uh, yeah. forget to do when looking at a hole just straight up off the tee pad. I think that's really good advice. And I wish I would have taken that last part of your advice this past weekend in the tournament we played in. Uh, we played in the Keeper of the Chains down here in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, the guy we actually interviewed last time, Logan Harpel, ended up winning the tournament. Congrats to Logan. But uh, on hole two, I did it. Both rounds, I nailed the first tree available. I did not learn from my mistake the first time, so I ended up having to take a double bogey both times because I just put myself so far in the rough. So I think that piece of advice would have saved myself some strokes and definitely would have been a better round. Um, yeah. And I think something that you also mentioned that's really interesting is kind of maybe maneuvering your body a little bit on the tee pad. You know, I know I've seen a lot of new players who they think that you just have to run straight up the tee pad. You can't, you know, kind of go to the left or right. And I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was at the D glow where you guys didn't even have to be on the tee pad at all. You could be off to the literal side mm -hmm. of it and still throw. Could you kind of talk about that and maybe just go in a little bit more detail how that can provide an advantage when you're teeing off? Yeah. So, I mean, at Deeglo, there was, I think, four or five holes that teeing off to the side of the pad opened up the gap majorly. So, like, on, I think one of the biggest ones was hole five. It's the, like, shot up the hill that goes into the kind of dark tree area and yeah um if you could tee off to the left of the pad and there it was really really tight on the right and it cut off the angle quite a bit so just teeing to that left side made the gap open up quite a bit and you were able to throw a much smoother back end turnover you weren't having to put so much angle and just hoping it would flex out you could kind of put like a smoother line that you know could generally fade to the basket so th th those kind of lines and thoughts of like trying to see how the tee pad angles towards the hole can make a big difference. Yeah. And so I guess building off that a little bit more, um, we saw it on your, on, on the end of a site, you've got 50 plus aces. I know myself, I've only hit one ace before. So could you talk a little bit maybe about, you know, how in the heck have you hit so many aces? What kinds of things are you doing in order to hit those aces? Or is it just everything that you've talked about so far, you know, doing that preparation beforehand, making sure you're hitting your lines, you know, utilizing the tee box to your advantage, you know, what kind of things are you, are you doing? Um, when it comes to aces, honestly, a lot of the time it's just a good shot thrown a little too hard. I feel like that's a lot, like 99% of my aces is, just throwing the line, hitting the gap, and then, um, yeah, just throwing a little too high or a little too hard, and it just smacks the chains. And uh, there's a lot of holes, like shorter holes, that I'll also like to do ace runs on. Like there's there's a course back home that I, I like to play, and it's kind of like a pitch and putt, and I've gotten three aces in one round there. And so it, it's fun to kind of just go to those shorter courses sometimes and just ace run everything as well. Yeah, I definitely feel that. I know I've got a course literally maybe five minutes away from my apartment complex where I think the furthest holes maybe like 240, something like that. So it, it's yeah. a very, very aceable one. I know I went out there the last time I played it, I literally had one go in the basket, but it went in so hard that it then flopped out of the basket. So that was very frustrating to have to deal <laughs> with. Um, so I guess before we get into the ace round, let's talk a little bit about your sponsor, Innova, Champion Innova. How did that happen? Did they approach you? Did you approach them? You know, w w take me through that journey in and of it itself. That's incredible for yourself. And I know the listeners would love to hear about it. Yeah. So Innova was the main manufacturer that I ended up throwing at the beginning, just because that was the disc store that they had nearby and so I definitely wanted to be sponsored by Innova that was my top choice um, going into trying to get sponsored and so yeah they I, I had talked to them previously in uh, I think 2017 2018 
and they were just kind of giving me a few t- what I need to do to kind of prove my my level and my worth on uh, their team. And then they approached me in, in 2019 uh, for a one-year sponsorship. And then we extended that agreement into the 2020 season. Nice. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Love to hear that. Hopefully they extend you again. I think by all means, they definitely should extend you again. Hey, send, send them this podcast. Tell them, hey, look at what I'm doing to help grow the sport. And uh, let, let's keep this thing going, man. Because uh, like I said, I think you're incredible talent. I think you're very close to breaking out and, and really being one of those guys who are mentioned like Eagle, like Kevin, like Ricky, like Paul, those guys. I think that's very close. And, and yeah, I would love to see nothing more for you to do it with Innova. But let's go ahead. Let's get into this ace round now and let's start off with question number one starting here with if you're taking a buddy to go by their first set of discs what one putter mid-range and driver do you tell them to get especially since they're just starting to play disc golf um if i was to bring a new person out to the course i'd probably recommend avr with can't go wrong there and then probably uh mako three for the mid-range, just a nice neutral straight flying mid-range. And then uh, fairway, I do a fairway driver for sure. And that would probably be something, something like a leopard, leopard three, or maybe a T-bird perhaps, but nothing, nothing too overstable for them. And cause the, I think the most important thing when getting a beginner in the game is getting them that they can throw that like hyzer flip that glides up and, rides a really long way in that beautiful S curve. I think that's what really hooks a new player. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Those are all really good answers. I know the AVR, that's what I started with. The Mako, that's like the only mid that my wife would throw. She's just obsessed with it. And then I remember starting out, all I wanted to throw was, all I wanted to throw was drivers. And someone kind of mentioned to me, cause I wasn't getting the distance I wanted, the accuracy to kind of maybe go down to a fairway. And I started throwing only with um, a T-Bird fairway driver, and it was just a game changer. I was more confident in my throws just because I was getting the consistent distance every single time. So those are all really good choices. All right, let's do question number two. Okay, favorite course you have played or one course you would love to play? Or you can do both if you want. All right, the favorite course that I've played – um, surprisingly enough is Fort Gordon for the 2017 worlds. I'm not sure what it was about that course, but I just really enjoyed it. it had a lot of good variety of shots and I think kind of challenged your whole entire game. So that's actually probably my favorite course that I've played, but I definitely, um, look forward to playing Yarva if that is still in the ground when I make it over to Europe and then also the beast for uh, European open. Nice. Those are some awesome choices. Our third question. What is one tip you would give to, you know, maybe it's yourself starting all over again or someone who's brand new to disc golf. What would be the one tip that you would tell them? Uh, I would say if they're looking to get better as fast as possible, I'd get a practice basket. That's one thing that I kind of wish I had done sooner was just, make the commitment by a cheap practice basket or even a good practice basket if you can afford it and a stack of 10 putters or so and just get those reps in every single day because that's like I said before the thing that can shave the most strokes off quickest and honestly throwing putters as well just in like a little field also helps you develop good form and consistency. Okay that's a really good tip right there really like that one. All right, number four, favorite memory playing disc golf? I would have to say that I was at Canadian Nationals last year. That whole entire tournament experience was extremely memorable. Uh, One, because I played very well at it. I stayed on lead card every single round and was competing for the win all three rounds. Uh, And then also just the whole mix-up of the hurricane going on at the same time was pretty and crazy. And it was just made for a really fun tournament experience and something that was really memorable. Nice. And then our final question here on this ACE round, number five, what is your goal moving forward in disc golf? Um, I would say my goal is just to play good, try to get on those lead cards, chase cards, 
any film cards really and get my name out there in the sport. I mean, that's my main goal is just to put myself out there, have the fans watch my gameplay and hopefully collect a few wins. Like that's really what I strive for each and every week. That's an awesome goal to have, man. I know you'll definitely get there. We've said it multiple times. We think you're very close to having that breakout performance and really solidifying yourself there at the top. And I I can't wait for it to happen. Hopefully it happens at this next tournament. That would be perfect. But super glad we were able to sit down and talk to you, Thomas. Do you have any final words you want to say before we get out of here? Uh, Just thanks to you guys for having me on. And thanks to my sponsors, End of a Champion Disc, uh, Pound Bags. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Chain Clankers podcast. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers and hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to us from so you never miss another episode.